The old world is ending, and we have the opportunity to rethink everything. This is a show about the structural problems in our world and the real solutions that we have today to transition from an apocalyptic storm of war, scarcity, and ecological collapse into a collaborative and sustainable futuristic society that serves all life. You may think it's an impossible dream, but the alternative is an inevitable nightmare. We're your hosts, Zachary Marlowe, Matt Holton, and Amanda Smith. And together, when we can move past this economic absurdity to come together and actualize our collective potential to create something completely new, we are Moneyless Society. There isn't a housing shortage. There's a shortage of connection. Humanity is more polarized right now than perhaps ever. And it's all due to the monetary system, the monetary machine, the socioeconomic model that we are all oppressed under currently, and its many arms, such as labels, isms, and arbitrary constructs that are put forth as nationalism, racism, classism, and produce results such as a plethora of systemic issues like the one we are about to discuss, homelessness. It's mind-boggling when you look at the situation as if you're looking inside from the outside. You take two people that have very few differences and sit them side by side and just because one has a house to live in and the other doesn't, the one with a house tends to forget the humanity of the one without a house. Indeed, we're all human, whether we sleep on a sidewalk or under a roof. And yet, somehow, the truths become elusive due to the social conditioning and the propaganda of the machine. And as I'm certain our guests will expound on today, we've got to get back to making those connections and remembering that no matter what a person has or hasn't materialized, they are just as human as their neighbor. This issue is deeply personal to me. I spent the last two years living in my truck in LA, working on a film about the impending collapse of our society, and the central issue I dealt with was the homeless crisis. No single event in my life changed me in a more profound way than diving into this issue, and it became a prism through which to view the whole of our failure as a society at the most fundamental level. It changed me as a person, and crystallized the need for radical, structural, and revolutionary change in this country that allows millionaires to look down from their high-rises on people with nowhere else to live but the sidewalk. It was on this journey that I serendipitously met the wizard, which is what I call my good friend David Bush Lilly, a living legend in LA activism, and a personal hero of mine who has devoted his entire life and put his body on the line, living on the streets in solidarity with the poor and oppressed of the world, and fighting for the rights of people on the streets. I met Ayman Ahmed, our other guest, through a similar twist of fate and immediately connected on a deep spiritual level. Ayman and a small group of other unhoused individuals created a truly beautiful community in Echo Park with very limited resources through the pandemic. I lived in my camper adjacent to the park, and uh, ma I made a short film about their community, which we'll link in the description so you can see for yourself. They grew a garden, built a communal kitchen and showers, and epitomized a true moneyless society. Not just a group of people existing nearby, tolerating each other, but coming together to do what, it, the, what the broader American society failed to do. Not just to deal with the crisis and meet people's needs, but to exceed them with love and real community. And what was the city's response to this loving community? They sent a small army of police and riot gear to tear it apart. With no communication or advance notice, the city spent over a million dollars to forcibly displace the occupants of the park. And when the, when the house community came out in a peaceful demonstration of support, excessive force doesn't cut it. They broke, people, they broke several people's bones, pointed guns at innocent people, and mass arrested, I think, 182 people. That's more arrests than throughout the entire Portland Uprising. And all of this in totally stark contrast to the pathetic, complicit response of police during the armed and bloody fascist insurrection at the Capitol. David and Iman were the last to leave and were finally arrested, leaving Echo Park a, a desolate war zone. With tents just, just left there. Everybody's property was there. Most people just took what they could carry and left. 
while cops took selfies and two of them actually went on a fucking swan boat ride after they did all this, just ravaged people's lives with complete impunity. The amount of money that they spent on this raid to break up this community could have literally housed all of these people for months. It just really epitomizes the ridiculous cruelty of this system. So I've said enough now. Um, I'm going to turn it to Ayman. Ayman, what's going on on the ground? I mean, it's sort of a lot to unpack, but I can start off with something I experienced two days ago. Uh, I went to wash. So when they came and raided us and kicked us out, they ended up taking all my stuff. So I basically just owned the clothes you see before you. And then in the past few days, I was able to get some underwear and socks and like another shirt. And I went to the laundromat to go wash that. And they wouldn't accept quarters. They only accept the card. And then the dryer starts at $1.75. And when you put your card in, it takes out 20 to make sure you had that $1.75. And then in three days, you get that 20 back. That's like a direct attack on poor people. Do you know how many of my unhoused neighbors don't have a bank card because they don't have an ID, let alone the ones that do to have $20 in it? You know, when you do laundry, you're scrounging around quarters. Like it was, it was such a scary thing to see because society's genuinely is like cutting out one fourth of the population from their thought process. So I'm in, I was actually living uh, outside of Echo Park in my RV and I discovered the community that you and others created there. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you created and how it worked and, and then what happened, what the city did, what their response was? So I want to be clear, like when we're using words like a, uh, like you created and things like that. It's nothing I created. I didn't create love. I didn't create community. And that's what we had at Echo Park. So when, when we, when I first got there, right, first I was homeless for a year and I was just living on the concrete, my backpack and a, and a blanket. I didn't even have a tent. And then uh, through police harassment, I made my way to Echo Park. I remember a large tent community there. And from the get, we just had an internal understanding when, when we would get like food or water or anything blessed to us, we would spread it amongst each other just from the get. And, you know, that's what community is. It's an internal thing. It's a heart and mind thing. So one of the things that made Echo Park, you know, such a good community is that we always talked about it. It was one of the main things we always talked about with each other was that we're a community, that we want to help each other out. And it just reinforced that to make us even stronger. And that's what we were, you know, we had chaos, we had ups and downs, we had fights, it's changing. We don't know who's there when they come, but we all had that communal understanding that we're in this together and we need to help each other out. And that wasn't me. That was everybody's spirit recognizing the truth of the situation. You know what I'm saying? And then what happened, I mean, what happened is Babylon sent their army and tore it all down. Like they sent 400 policemen for a community of old women and old men. And I'm, I was the youngest guy there, like me and like two other guys. Like what? You sent an army, you tore down showers, you tore down a kitchen, you tore down a garden. You know, the goal of that community was to break down label barriers that keep us divided, right? Housed and unhoused. These are words. Like she was saying, Amanda, at the end of the day, we're human, right? Uh, captain of this, sergeant of that, all these extra words that divide us, fucking president, uh, I work here, enough with these words. These are labels. At the end of the day, there's a common humanity. So when we built that garden, that was housed and unhoused working together, right? Same thing with that kitchen and them showers. So what Mitch and the city did is they tore down a genuine community that was trying to love their neighbors. Everybody from rich to poor in their own way was just trying to love each other. And that's what they came and tore down. I think that's a really good point that you touched on also just about people talking and communicating. And honestly, uh, that's kind of one of the most disappointing factors that I've seen in, in modern society as well Is our, our lives have kind of become so compartmentalized and so separated. Uh, you know, that we're, we're all concer so concerned about our own just survival within the system here that we that we've kind of forgotten that we actually do depend on this larger kind of, uh, you know, system and systemic reciprocity. And but the communication that, you know, used to be in these communities where people knew each other and cared for each other and really had had their back is gone. And I think that's you, you kind of touched on something there that's really important that a lot of people kind of haven't um, really, uh, you know, explored a lot is, is the whole communication, the talking 
networking aspect, you know, um, the trust, developing those relationships, um, you know, and, and kind of just everybody getting their concerns out to one another and, and working through them in a civilized, you know, democratic manner through communication, through respect, uh, through reciprocation, through sharing, through things like that. And it's not like those are tools that have suddenly vanished or something. They're still here. And I think we can still, you know, uh, cultivate those and bring those about in the types of, uh, you know, societies that we want to see in the future. And I just, I just wanted to point, I think that's a really great example and, uh, and something that's really great to see in situations like that. So, so I thank you for, for that information and for, uh, you know, bringing that to light. I think that's great. Yeah, I can, I, I could just, um, enhance on that. Um, and I don't know how effectively I can do it as emotional as I am right now, because it just blew my mind. One thing that you just said, I want to get something straight when it comes to creation. I didn't create love or community. Like, wow. Like that just blew my mind because I've been homeless and it sucks. And the divisive narrative that keeps people from literally living their lives is what has to be brought down. You know, the thing about love is it's not a clearly cut mowed lawn and a haircut saying hi to your neighbor, Bob. Like, love is colorful and it has its ups and downs. And especially when you're dealing with people varying in ages, you know, if you're dealing with a 40 year old, he's got 40 years of experience you don't know about, 40 years of whatever. You, so you're dealing with people as they come and that takes on a lot of colors, but ultimately, everybody just wants stability and peace. You know, everybody's just trying to live their life. And that's why when people come with this narrative or with this googly eye thing, when they find out that I'm homeless and like, whoa, what are you surviving out there? No, the toughest part about being homeless is the city and the LAPD. That's the toughest part. But actually being outside and with people, you know, that's the best part. And to, to what you were saying, Matthew, like, Community, it's difficult the way we have the world mapped out now with these homes and these apartments, these square prisons that keep you in your own mind. See, what we had was a tent community. So when we got up every day, we saw each other every day, right? That's part, that's part of what makes a community work. Look at communities in the past, and they were villages. You have to interact, see each other, and cultivate that land together. But when you're trapped in your box, it's very hard to get people interested in community because if you're alone all day, you're only thinking alone thoughts. Does that make sense? Well, I was just going to say to uh, to sort of stick to that, um, to sort of pick up on saying, talking about the, the differences in experience. I kind of want to bring David into the conversation here. Well, uh, thank you, Marlo. I mean, I've, uh, I've been homeless uh, actually for over 20 years now. And I mean, Amanda, I feel it. You know, I mean, for me, my experience was... I never experienced a day of homelessness in my life until I was almost 40. I was a bus mechanic for the city, and I am of the 70s generation. And I think what happened with myself was I saw so many people today that we would call boomers. I'm a late boomer. And when I saw things like Ronald Reagan not get impeached over the Iran-Contra affair, or just his election, that was, I, th I think a lot of boomers didn't register what was coming. I think uh, they, they grew up in an era where they thought that positive change, like women's rights, like gay rights, like uh, uh, voting rights, were just going to happen on their own. And when it started slipping away, it was rather like homelessness. You lost, we lost a vision in this country. And when you're homeless, it, it is rather like you have one vision of the world and then you're thrust through a mirror and you see the other side. It's, uh, it's a horror that people are experiencing at younger and younger ages now, ever since the 2000 market crash. And I think the, as horrible as it is for us, you got to look at half the people on the planet living on two bucks a day or less. And that's one of the things that has always sustained me. I realize that even as Americans, 
you know, they, they do want to make a fetish out of homelessness. Uh, they want to put it on some kind of pity pedestal rather than do like Ayman um, has stood for from the beginning, which is we are people and I refuse to be isolated from the rest of society. So it was very inspiring after 20 years. Uh, what happened around Echo Park, it's made news all around the world. And it is news all around the world because homeless people of a whole new generation are stepping forward and saying, we're going to change this from the streets with our own resources because you and the government are not doing it. And it is also about, as Iman says, connecting with love. I mean, one of the first things that I did, I found, was the, because of the way people stigmatize you the minute you have any indication you might be homeless, I thought, well, I'm going to put something around my neck to give them something to think about. <laughs> And I found that it was a great tool to put out this little necklace of mine and, and that was inspired by a flower child, actually, that I had met. Because it started conversations where people would have normally not even talked to me. But there's so many lessons that we all learn through homelessness. Uh, nightmares as well as great visions like, you know, that we all see and bring us together to a place like this where we're looking at what is the root of homelessness. It's, it's uh, money that's dividing us all. And when you take away the money, like Iman did, and you throw people together and you take away the class divisions and the cultural divisions and you realize, hey, we're all in this community together, that's really the message of this entire planet. And money right now is obscuring that. And it's why the planet is falling apart. It's why societies are falling apart. And as long as they keep us trapped in money, we're going to continue. They're going to continue to control us. So it's a, it's a wonderful thing to be talking about this here. I agree. And thank you for directing that at me in the beginning. I appreciate you being um, you all being gracious with my emotional uh, state. But what do you expect, you know, um, to, to speak on what you said there? I just wanted to point out um, the, the contrast that general society has when it comes to perceiving homeless people and the fact that the two of you, not, not to give you all the credit, as, as Amon would not, would not want, but the two of you particularly have roasted the competency of the, the ruling class and the political figureheads and the authorities in your area and for this country. Because the two of you with your helpers and your friends and your community have exemplified how possible it is to create a functioning society and an exponentially beneficial one at that, that is a truly rehabilitating environment. And yet our tax dollars and our um, lottery revenue and, and our votes and our voices, they're not helping any because we're not in control. People like you two are not in control per se. People like you two aren't making the decisions that need to be made. And that, that to me is, is my uh, favorite and least favorite aspect of it all. Like you two are showing what can be done, but the right people aren't listening or acknowledging it. And that's the, that, that's like the epitome of frustration for me and Zach, at least. And, and when, when I say that you two have, have made this impact on so many people, I just want to know, how does that make you feel? What kind of hope does that give you going forward? Uh, can, can you see the things that you're doing actually um, bringing about tangible change? In terms of community building, the, the reality is the power structures that rule us won't allow a community of love to prosper because it breaks people out of their, their hard-earned narrative. You know, the power structures right. have been at this for decades now. Hollywood's been at this for decades. They've been working with the government. Like, this isn't conspiracy as fact. And they've done it to keep us divided. And I think that fundamentally, uh, even before money, it comes down to two perspectives on life. Either the one they tell you where you're amazing, you go out and get them, you know, you become whatever you want to become, become the best version of yourself, all that you, you, you talk where you just really strive to be the best you, or the other perspective where we're serving each other and we're working as a community. You know, like there's two perspectives to choose from. And from that fundamental root are these problems, because if you see, especially in this culture in America, it's all this you, 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 you got this, you get it, you get it, you get it. If you think like that, if you're only thinking about the girl you got or the family you have or the things you have, I mean, even the tax collector did that. Like, there's nothing good about that. It's people aren't taking the time to really dive into what it means to love your neighbors, what it means to love. I mean, you have to do something with that love. You can't just say it and then go back to living a completely selfish life. There's a major disconnect, you know, because a lot of people are good natured people, 
but there's a disconnect with them and their actions. You know, they're not doing anything with their love. They're sort of just sitting on it and keeping it in their own little nucleus. And we will fail if that's the case as a species, because as a species, we have to work together. You know, Marlo might be good at making videos and Gustavo's good at building stuff. And I might be good with the words and together we could build <laughs> together. We could build something, but individually, nothing to get done. Everything would get torn apart. One of the central failures of this system is the amount of talent is the amount of innovation and creativity is the amount of the desire for people to work and to create that is in no way incentivized by this society, which is just putting up walls all the time. Uh, you were talking a minute ago about kind of getting to the root of things. And I'm, I'm just struck with this. I mean, in thinking about this process of, of being, you know, on the streets myself and, and talking to so many people and, you know, connecting with sages like David, who, who really helped me to go so much deeper in my understanding. There's so many insights that to spend a year on the streets and for anybody out there, you're going to understand the system way better than you could in four, five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 years of studying it in books, studying it in economics textbooks. And really one of the deep insights is that this problem doesn't need to exist at all, that we have the money and the resources. It exists because I think it's perpetuated because people in tents on the sidewalk, they're like people crucified on crosses along the Roman road. They show you don't step out of line because 99% of people hate their jobs, hate their jobs. 90 to 99% of people hate the existence that they have to do to continue to exist in this world. And it's a threat. It's a threat that the people on the sidewalk, it's like, if you don't participate in this system, if you don't generate profit for the machine, the empire, then you will end up like this. You will end up in a horrible, deplorable situation. And the thing about y'all's community, the thing about a lot of these communities, like the communities that that David has been a part of in Venice that I've documented extensively is that these communities fly in the face. They are the greatest middle finger or the greatest form of like success thriving as revenge to the system, that the system cannot stand to see people who are unhoused, who have no money, smiling. They can't stand to see them getting married, growing a garden, living a good life. They can't stand to see that their system has failed so completely that people with absolutely no money are happier than they are. And that's what y'all have, have been a part of. And, and that's what I see every time I connect with somebody on the streets. It's like I had this experience on Halloween a couple of years ago in L.A. And I was hanging out with all these rich yuppies in some club. And I told some girl, she was like, what have you been up to? She said she'd gotten a job on Space Jam 2 as an extra. And it, it, it rejuvenated her zeal for life. It was just like, you're ridiculous. She asked what I was doing. And I said, I've been working with and helping to feed the homeless. And she said, ew. And I just walked away. I was like, these are not my fucking people. I went to the bridge with, with a, another activist friend that David and I know, Ingrid. We brought food. And I just had a beautiful night. I connected with real people. I had, I had, a, I had a human connection. And that is what is so lacking. And if anybody is, is listening to this, I would encourage you to connect with your neighbors on the street. Because they, are, they truly are living in abundant ways that you can't imagine. That the spirit grows enormously when you live like that your sense of love your sense of connection your sense that you are all that we are all in this together and that something shared is so much more valuable than something hoarded and that thing is love that thing is love that when you have nothing else when you have no money to fall on or to insulate you from the, the horrors of this world the man-made horrors love will protect you every time I, I just want to jump in here real quick, and I just want to say one thing. I want to make one thing very clear as a person who's been out on the street for 20 years, and that is that uh, what, what the community built in Echo Park Lake you, you know, was a process of growing and growing together, and there were, there were a lot of people there that made something uh, over the year, and I myself had heard about it, and when I got there uh, for the last six months or so of it, uh, so much of the groundwork had been laid by Iman and other people um, that in a place that I don't think would have been possible in Venice the way it was possible in that beautiful natural setting of the lake. But the credit goes to, um, you know, the people, and also I think a lot of credit goes to the community, the house community around Echo Park Lake, people like uh, Echo Park Street Watch. Uh, the, the, the coming together of both house and home, homeless there and giving people a chance to be free, I think Iman would tell you, uh, you know, more about that. Yeah, I mean, let me just, uh, before I go into a bit more about the community, because it's just so funny that 
people respond to what Echo Park was and they respond to like the showers we built and the kitchen we built as like a point of genius. They're like, oh, tell us about the showers. Bro, I didn't invent showers either. Like they've existed. We just built a place for people to shower because the city puts no thought in it. I got to say, though, they're beautiful, Lyman. I mean, they're, they're, <laughs> they were made out of some great wood and they had great they had great drainage. They were engineered with love. Yeah, but it's like Marlo said, like that shower was built by probably like 15 different hands. Like mine might have been the most consistent, but 15 different hands that know about building. I know nothing about building. I just said, let's have showers. People who knew about it and then we got together. But like, first, let me just like clear up something that the system created the narrative that the tent outside is the worst position you could be in. But remember, that's a false narrative. Outside is actually really awesome and pleasant. Just it's nice outside. Just go outside and sleep. All right. And you've experienced it. It's it's pleasant. Yeah. No, la- last time I checked, people pay to live in, t- live in tents for short periods of time, right? <laughs> it's in campgrounds and stuff, right? So to me, it's like, it, it, it's almost kind of like the way you interpret it, right? It could be like an extended vacation almost too. Especially right? <laughs> if it's not in a place like uh, the Dakotas where they had the Dakota access pipeline and you had you know, you didn't have a, we don't have that, that cold winter here. Southern California is a blessing of geography that allows the human spirit to flourish all year round. And they're trying to cover it over with capitalism and fake entertainment and all of that stuff when there should be more parks in LA and, and, and less Hollywood walks of fame. Cause there's a lot of false narratives that we have to break through and just get to the root of. And the thing about the outside being horrible or tent life being horrible is another word for tent is tabernacle. I mean, people have been living in tents for thousands and thousands of years. It's not outside that's horrible. And I can attest to it. I've lived outside even without a tent. As long as you're warm and dry and not in a bug infested area so they're not biting you while you sleep, you're good. Wherever you are in the world, you're good. Sleep is sleep, food is food. It doesn't need to be eaten at a five-star restaurant. It needs to just get inside of you and get digested. You know what I'm saying? I, I mean, that reminds me of something uh, you said in a, a live. You said you said this with so much fire and passion. I sent it to 20 people. It was amazing. You were you were speaking out, and it was about when the uh, the police were arresting you and David, and basically the, the 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 cops said like nothing in this world is free. Oh, that nonsense out of his mouth. Yeah, we were uh, we were at uh, what is it the Metropolitan Detention Center, and uh, David was talking to the cops in banter. Personally, I don't. Because if you got me in cuffs, you're not my friend. Uh, if we're not talking about my God, I'm not talking to you at all. And uh, David was talking with him, and he said some. I know what David said to him, but then the cop goes, uh, "Well, there's nothing in life that's free." And then at that point, my spirit felt urged to speak up because I've been living a reality in which I've had nothing, and yet I've had everything. So the cop was said that there's nothing in life that's free, and I can attest to that not being true, right? I'm a fan of my God. You know, I got him tatted in the words in Scripture, and it says very specifically, and it's a fact I've lived, that if the sparrows eat, so will you. Implication of those words are look around at creation. Look at creation. Don't look at society and the false creation we created. Look at the actual thing that was made separate from humanity, right? Um Look at the birds. They wake up not knowing what they're going to eat, yet every night they're full. We know this because they're alive until they die. Look at any other animal. It's the same for us. If you don't know what you're going to eat next, you will eat. If you don't know where you're going to sleep or what you're going to wear, those will be provided. Now, we don't got to go too much into the theology of it, but these are just facts. Facts I've experienced on my years outside. So when the cop said nothing in life is free, I quoted him that scripture. I said, well, you know, um, God feeds the sparrows, he'll feed you too. And then the cop decides that's the perfect moment to just be a jackass. And he goes, oh, do you eat sparrows? What? (laughs) This is why they're not my friends. These people are separate than the people I'm used to, right? they're They're not normal people, these people, especially when they're in that uniform. They're trapped up in the system. I don't care what anybody says. If If a person and a uniform loses their humanity because of that uniform and off of an order puts holes in you for no reason, this is not a real person. This is somebody trapped in the system. They don't have their own thoughts. They don't have their own spirit form yet. They've been too busy buying things and thinking that'd make them happy. But um, uh, I think I went on a rant. (laughs) That's why we're here.
I think the point I, Iman makes is an excellent one, and that is it, when you're in a setting like that where you're around community and your connection is with people rather than your alienated role in a, in a production system that's out to create monopoly and to, uh, to, cre to tell people that you, you know, that, that your worth has something to do with the size of your wallet rather than the size of your heart that you see the contrast so glaringly and is is very freeing you know and places like this i mean people go out you know into rural areas and they create these communities but having a community like this right in the heart of the city uh, that is powerful and we need and i think one of the lessons i've learned is we need to see more of those things where people are right there in the city, setting an example, setting, showing contrast, and that will open up a lot of minds. Uh, rather than retreating to the countryside, let's get to where they really need to see the contrast. Right, and I think there's something that's kind of um, important to add on to that too. I think, I think the particular situation where you guys were in the park there was probably conducive to something like that happening. Like you said, David earlier, like something like that probably wouldn't have happened at least to the extent that it did uh, in some place like Venice. I got a quick a quick observation here, and it's that the the difference between walking through Skid Row, where it's just wall to wall blackness and concrete and sterility, and there's not so much as a single tree, and and everyone's terrified, and it's a terrifying it's a, it's a play. I mean, not everybody is terrified. I mean, there's still a lot of community there. There's still a lot of beauty, but it's way more difficult. I mean, and just the the general vibe, man, is way more oppressive than being in Echo Park, like walking through Echo Park in that community, all the NIMBYs on the fucking, on the calls were like, I'm afraid to take my kids there. And it's like the vibe in that park was so peaceful, was so healthy and happy. I felt so safe. There were so many beautiful interactions that I had. I really felt like I was in a part of a community. You know, you walk down you're like, Hey, how you doing? There's birds chirping. The lake is beautiful. People are connected to nature. And that's, that's a huge thing. Any system, any progressive move forward, any view of progress that is to bathe this gorgeous bio biodiverse earth in more concrete to flatten it out and make it less humane, make it to take shade away in the form of trees, that's not progress. That in a true utopian or even protopian, just, just a commonsensical view of what the earth can be, it is to create more communities where people are connected to nature, where we are living connected to nature and not cut off from it. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Because I was going to say, like, Echo Park was a blessed spot. You know, from day one, you could feel that it was, like, just a blessed spot. And even the lady that made the park and carved it out in the city, Amy, if you know her story, she made it for the gangs and she made it for the unhoused. She made it for that part of society that was looked down upon. And, you know, God bless her for that. And uh, nature is huge, huge to mental health and healing, right? Even science says that when someone's depressed, you can take them to the mountains and you'll watch that depressed fly away. Like nature is huge because we're life living in life. That's what nature is. You remember that you're, you're just always surrounded by life. And when you're in a concrete jungle of death and ego, the vibe is different. But with that said, with that said, what made the community work was the internal understanding of the people. Because nature itself is separate from us and it remains peaceful. It's the human side that we sort of have that control over. And the people in the park, through multiple conversations, through a lot of ups and downs, through a whole year of family love and drama, right, that's what made it peaceful was the people. So if given the opportunity under a bridge underpass, we could create something amazing and beautiful. The issue is Babylon will not give us that opportunity. As soon as a community starts to grow, I mean, look what happened before Echo Park, at Grant Park, at Occupy LA. Anytime a community of mutual aid, love, and support is actually working and thriving, system comes and shuts it down. So we have, like, we have a larger issue that I don't think people are talking about enough, and it's the fact that we live in an Orwellian police state, and we do. Uh, after they had kicked us out of the park, we decided to do a vigil around the park, a peaceful vigil where we would walk uh, with the park on our right side with a candle. We'll walk around to mourn the loss of our public space and our public will. And then in front of our councilman's office, we'll drop off the candle and then everybody leave. Right. So the plan was to not congregate so as not to attract the police. And we didn't. We did one lap, kept it quiet. It was a silent vigil as well. 
Uh, we took down the, the candles, and guess what we were met with as people were leaving and a few were just hanging out with each other? Because we're citizens, we have a right to hang out with each other. We were met with a helicopter shining its light on us, a police helicopter, and we were met with a police drone. We are in a police state. We're in such a state where the voice of a few people dictate what happens to the majority of people. Because honestly, the majority of people are relatively on the same page with love. It's just whether they're taking action with it is where we're different. But it's a few people, unseen rich voices that are dictating the will of these politicians who then decide what the police do, who then fuck us all. So right now, we don't have a voice unless we have a singular voice. Like we have to, and that's been what we're doing now, just on a side note, but we have to unite as a people, take labels away, barriers away, housing, unhoused away. We don't have a voice right now. We're in a genuine police state. And if let's say at the end of this podcast, someone heard it and someone said, you know what? I wanna live in love too fuck all the bullshit, and they started just loving their neighbors, and it started to work out, they would get shut down. I don't care if it was in Alabama, I don't care if it was in North Carolina. The government will shut down community and love because we're in a police state, and they want you to pay landlords and be separate. And that's a larger issue. We cannot build something if they're going to keep shutting that shit down. We have to unite and gain our voice back as a, as a whole before we take steps to solve homelessness. Put all that to the side. We have to gain our voice back. On the note of trying to gain the voice back, living in a police state and uniting, I have a prime example as to why that seems such an impossibility. I, I, uh, I did some research before today because I wanted to learn a little about each of you and um, see what I could gain insight on as far as your backstories. And of course, the media obscures everything that is accurate. I, I would just like to personally call out Los Angeles Times, the LA Times and the article, the disgusting article that they wrote on this uh, on this event. And, and I have a quote here from that article, and it says, the showdown at Echo Park Lake with its verdant views and deep connections to local history has crystallized much of the debate over homelessness in LA, which to me implies that the historical quote unquote value of a piece of property is more important than human value. But anyway, um, and going on, it says, should homeless people be allowed to congregate on any public land? Okay, first of all, Everybody has a right to exist, no matter if it's public or private or what. So what are you, owned by the GOP? That's freaking disgusting. What the hell? This is news in 2021? How, in like the most progressive city in the country? Get yeah. real. Like I could not, that just blew me back a hundred years. That is so archaic. It's not even funny. And this is why communities like yours and one I used to belong to and still consider myself a part of, because God knows we still struggle day to day, cannot quote unquote find their voice or propagate it beyond the barriers of the divisive narrative that's still being used in major publications to socially condition people to polarize instead of unite. And it goes on to say, what is the city's obligation to, excuse me, to the homeless and to the housed as juxtaposed? Well, first of all, we could not allow people to end up homeless. We could uh, use truly rehabilitating policy and truly progressive and humane treatment and uh, procedures and what have you, protocols, whatever fancy words you wanna use for it to actually bring people out of this dark hole that we're trying to bury them in and, and create an egalitarian society. We could start there and, and not continue to use this ridiculously amateur archaic narrative like can somebody help me stop this <laughs> like that that's what i'm thinking in my mind like how do we stop this from being allowed to be what is published versus what's actually going on you know what's actually going on needs to be published so my new motto is cancel money save lives because money is what is causing this bullshit to be propagated one of the books that set me on the path that I found myself on now uh, at 65 is something I read when I was 25. It was actually one of the most famous books in the country uh, that is largely forgotten. It was the third largest seller from 1800 to 1900. Only two other novels outsold it. And it's a book about a moneyless society. It was called Looking Backward. And Eugene Debs, uh, the famous socialist, actually said that everything that he stood for in politics came from reading that book. Uh, it was an amazing book where it, it really lays out a vision of, well, you know, and it's and it shows how practical it is. People say moneyless society, how practical could that be? Well, I recommend you take a look at looking backward 
and read the middle uh, eight chapters because it's a conversation about, well, how would artists function? How would people choose their careers? And the answers there, we all know, they're obvious. And rather than looking at zombie movies that tell us how to create a zombie or an apocalypse movie, how to fight a war against a robot, we should be looking at more uh, narratives that tell us what we already know, how much better <laughs> we would be off if we had a value other than money. I mean, what you were talking about with the police state, I, th I think that makes a lot of sense too. But I, I, I'm curious why something like that happened um, at the Echo Park location and and why it's not happening other places to as much of an extent possibly as it happened there. Now, would it work as well, say, under a bridge, like you're saying? Or, or would be would there be elements there that you would be missing? Hence, like, you know, the, the nature aspect and things like that, you know? I mean, could you, could you duplicate this, say, in like a sterile, cold environment? Would it be the same as, as living in this, you know, nature, you know, filled environment by the park and things like that? Or how, how significant was the natural aspect to everything that happened? So nature is super important to the human condition. Uh, when you've ever walked in the, in the forest and you felt that breath of fresh air and you just felt just way better and connected, I mean, that's what nature does. But you, even with that being the case, it's up to the people living in the community to make their decision on the perspective and fight for it. It's not nature arbitrarily making us love each other because before, before we got there, uh, Echo Park had tents and the tents were filled... Uh, with people who didn't understand community were caught up in their drugs and gang life. I mean, straight up, they were mm -hmm. caught up in their false narratives about what their version of reality was. And they lived it. You're going to live what it is you perceive to be reality. That's what you're going to live. So if you think you're a gangster on the streets, that's the reality you're going to live. If you're a drug addict and you just want to get high, that's the reality you're going to live. So it isn't nature that was like, here, you all be peaceful because then there'd be peace in all these nature spots. It's people have to make the decision on how they want to live this life and how they want to view this world. And unfortunately, a lot of that is being made for them. And thus you get the terminology of sheep. We have a lot of people not thinking for themselves and, putting these, and having these narratives put on them. That's why they're unhappy in their life that they are. You know, the truly wicked people, they're enjoying their money and their isolation and their car and their girls because they're wicked and they only care about themselves. The 99% Marlo spoke of, they're trapped in that wicked person's narrative but they hate it because they got love, but they don't know why they're trapped. So they're still stuck in that. Shit. Like, so can this community be built anywhere? Absolutely. If we can be guaranteed to not be torn down by the power structures. I mean, the power structure tore down Echo Park because of its growth, love and community. It did the same to Grant Park. Grant Park had something similar going on. I've heard a lot from a lot of different people, something very similar going on, a community of love, a community of mutual aid and support, and they shut it down because at the end of the day, a spirit, a soul, it cannot deny truth when it hears truth, when it sees truth. And when you walk into a community and see people happy with nothing, your spirit can't deny the truth of that, that you actually never needed those things that you think you needed to be happy. It can't deny the truth of that. So nature is awesome, and I love nature. And Marlo's right. We need to tear down these concrete jungles and make it more eco-friendly where we're living with nature. But beyond that, it's up to the people involved. It's up to the people involved. That's why repeating the community was so important, right? Having weekly meetings. See, at one point, we actually had a jobs program. We ended up spending close to fourteen to 15000 paying everybody in the community. We got blessed through various means to do this jobs program, and it went, uh, it went really well in terms of fundraising. We were just getting a lot of money and able to pay people, and the job was divided like this. You could work at the donation, work at the kitchen. Uh, if you do four hours, that's 40, or you could pick up trash. One trash bag is 20 bucks, two trash bags is 40, and we did a cap of 200 a week. So you can make up to 200 a week. And people in the tent, basically everybody was working at one point. At one point, everybody was working in the park to keep the park clean. And that was bullshit. Fuck money. You know what it did? It made it so people would only pick up trash if they got 20 bucks or they would only help if they got this money. So we canceled money, took it out. Now, if you're going to help, it has to come from the heart. Now, if you're going to do this, it has to come from the heart. And you're not going to violate our community rules. This is important for self-regulation. So as a majority, we got together and decided we didn't want to live how the world viewed us, like trash. Because remember, it's people living in these tents, not homeless people, people. So 
they're used to grease. They're keeping their room clean. You know what I mean? My room was a bit dirty. Other people's looked like a New York City apartment if you went into their tent. I'm telling you, they had it set up nice. So the majority of us got together. We decided on the ground rules, right? No stealing, no unprovoked violence, no excessive trash. And then you'd have individuals that come thinking they could do what they want, right? And that's not going to happen in our community because we don't want to live like this. They, they come with their perspective. It's a battle of perspectives. If all of mankind was wiped out, nature would still be here. So that's separate from what we're talking about. We're talking about the human mind and the perspective. And if you come with one perspective uh, that says A, and another person has a perspective that says B, one of those perspectives will win out. And then that's how everyone's going to live. So we chose the perspective of love and community, and others tried to come with individual this, that, and the other, but they failed because the majority of us maintained it. We maintained it by continually talking about it, by continually growing it. Every day we would talk about the community with each other. We even got shirts printed out, right? You have to reinforce these things. You can't just say it once and then come back a week later thinking that it has to be your conversation. It has to be on the tip of your tongue and your heart and your mind. You have to really be dedicated to living in peace and loving each other. You know what I mean? Yeah, we all have to be as dedicated to it as the um, ruling class is dedicated to keeping it the exact opposite exactly. way. Exactly, <laughs> and they're super dedicated. <laughs> I want to, I want to second uh, Iman's observation about it's about the people more than about the setting. And I mean, we've seen settings like uh, at the Dakota Access Pipeline where it was the love of people for doing the right thing in balance with nature, but it was their love for one another in the, the very harsh conditions there. You can set up communities of love in subways in New York City, you can, and there have been set up there. You can set up communities of love in high rises. You can set them up. Uh, John Steinbeck talks about setting them up in a, in a bean field in Grapes of Wrath. And, you know, it is, so it is about getting away from the values of money and getting back to the values of the heart. As, as I, so I would second what Iman said, uh, you know, it's about putting love first wherever you find yourself. And anybody watching this, that's the lesson to take away. Uh, if, we, if you're looking for paradise on the outward side, you'll never find it on anywhere because it starts on the inside. I have a, a, a point here to sort of piggyback off something Iman was talking about, about the people with the money, the one percenters, that they, that they have their girls in their cars and that they're happy there. But, but I see that they're not happy. They're, they're truly, truly, deeply unhappy and they're vacuous and they, they put their worth in money, in the, the amount of money they have, and they feel empty. You get people like Donald Trump that has everything. He's a fucking king. Bruce Springsteen's got this line. It's like, poor man want to be rich, rich man want to be king, and the king ain't satisfied till he owns everything. And even then, you can own everything, and you're not satisfied because you can look out on this kingdom that, you, that has your name on it. The biggest, tallest building in the world has your fucking dumb name on it, and you still feel empty because it's like, that's all I'm worth? Really? Because we're a spiritual being. We're not, a, we're not just a body. We're not just the things that we do and the job that we create. We're the happiness that we create. We're ephemeral. We're the ideas that, we, that are in our hearts. We're the goodness that we have in us. We are way beyond this construct. We are way beyond anything that they think that we can be, that we think we can be. And anytime we try to judge ourselves of any material metric, we're going to come way short of what we truly are, which is everything. That we are consciousness interacting with itself in each of us. And when we disconnect ourselves from each other, we are disconnecting ourselves from our true source, from the true source of happiness, from the true source of intelligence, from this. It's not just about community. It's not you and me and nature and us. It's all of us. That's all of us that we are together. And when we cut ourselves off from that, when we reduce ourselves by saying that I am worth this, your life is worth this because it has this totally arbitrary metric on it, we've taken it away from the true gold standard, which is love, which is the value that love has. Yeah, I know. I think that's a really great point, too, um, especially about the um, I totally lost my train of thought. I'm it's OK. Sorry. Thank God for an editor. Try again. <laughs> just just cut cut <laughs> that one. <laughs> it's also profound. It's hard to no keep worries. the train of I, thought, really. You know, like how, how often do you have these conversations? Yeah. Like this is layers and layers deep. This is every day, these Amanda. Are, well, good for you, Marlo. <laughs> right. Beam me up. OK, um, no, seriously, that is good. But like the general no. general population is so incredibly shallow and i don't oh. mean that to be like uh critical of people in general but like of society in general you know like there's just these conversations just don't happen on a daily basis unless you are experiencing the things that we're talking about here i mean you really have to experience it to know it so i thought it was really insightful too like about how uh you were talking about 
essentially when you're in, you know, the structure of modern society, you're kind of so busy that you don't really have time to think about a lot of these things. It's like you're on the you're on the wheel in a sense. You know, you're you're a rat on the wheel, you're a cog on the wheel, and and that's kind of like your sole function going there. But when that system starts to break down for you, when you become uh, ejected, you know, from that system in a sense, then all of a sudden your brain power and your physical power are freed up. Uh, you know, to move in directions like these and to notice these things and to start, you know, cultivating these ideas, both in your mind, uh, you know, and in the community around you. And um, I mean, to me, that would make sense, too. It's kind of like, you know, if, if you're if you're so absorbed within the current system, you just don't have, you know, the the tools or the facilities necessary in order to really start creating something new. And uh, I, I think that makes a lot of sense too. kind of it, it, how it would happen in a place or, or, or with people in a mindset like that, too, who are just, you know, have been, you know, kind of removed from the current system and who have the, uh, you know, the the I guess you could call it the necessary brain space, you know, to to focus and think about things like that because they're not so caught up, you know, in, in the current system. So I, I think that's very interesting as well. Real quick quote here. I think it was either Sartre or Camus. I can't remember. There's he who is rowing the boat can't rock it. And it's like if we are so wrapped up in dealing with the 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 pettiness of this system of just raw survival, which is what we're all trapped up in. We're all trapped up in survival. And even those people who have monstrous abundances, they're still in this scarcity based survival mode that our potential is truly limited because we are spending all of our time and our effort and our energy and I think this is exactly what you're saying, Matt, that, that we're, we're all wrapped up just chasing the chasing the dragon. You know, it's really just like I just get this really disgusting feeling of like this just reminder of being a drunk, of being an alcoholic, of chasing a of chasing a fix in something that never comes, you know, that you always get a little piece of it and it's never enough. You just keep going again and again and again, and you're never really fulfilled. You're never really satisfied. And it just keeps you from your true potential that really we're here coming together today and always to meet our potential, to see what we can do, to see what we can be, and to trans- to terraform this society right out from under its feet into something that can sustain human life and to get us to these conversations, to get us to this, this spirit of this pioneering innovation, C- the courage that it takes to leave the, the, the bounds of what we accept, this dream. Yeah, I'd, li- I'd just like to say to everybody watching this, uh, you know, uh, take away some good thoughts and take away the inspiration that we're talking here. And, you know, what sprang up in Echo Park is springing up in lots of places all around the country. And it's going to continue to spring up in L.A. Uh, if you come to L.A., come come on through Echo Park. Come on and meet up with the folks at Echo Park Street Watch. Come up and, and meet the community there. I think one of the things that happened in Echo Park was that it was uh, a very working class community. It's the people who are connected with, uh, you know, human ambitions rather than the outsized ambitions that alienate us from our humanity, whether it's in our spirituality, whether it's technology or uh, fetishes for uh, uh, fame and and riches. Um, But take away some good thoughts from this and um, know you're not alone. Uh, We're all here. And we, as long as we keep sharing like this, this is unstoppable. So don't stop sharing. Uh, Actually, I I have one more question for you, David, and then I want to get to the good stuff. And this is a question we tried to get when we were filming a a thousand times, you know, David gave me the great honor of saying that I was, I was the only filmmaker that he would ever let film him or up to that point anyway. And uh, we, we kept getting to this and putting it off, being like, oh, all right, this, this, let's just get this out of the way interview of like, what is the cause of homelessness? You know, the macroeconomic, socioeconomic cause of homelessness. And David, I kind of want to put that to you and I'm in, like, what, what is the, other than a moral failing or a failing of vision, what is the systemic uh, consequence? What is the systemic cause of this problem? And then I want to really get that shit out of the way and let's talk about where we go from here. Uh, I'll let me go first and I'll let Iman wrap it up because quite frankly, the cause of homelessness is obsessing about homelessness. <laughs> Stop obsessing about it. Just be human. That's what I would say. I mean, if I had to put my thought to it in terms of the systemic reason for homelessness, they're just, they're making it ridiculous right now. They're raising the prices of all of existence from your apartment to the dang dryer at a, at a laundromat. 
You know, you need 20 bucks to dry your clothes. What? They're just raising the price. I'm sure they have their own backroom reasons for it. Uh, but I mean, that's probably the systemic reason why more and more people are getting homeless because they're making housing unaffordable. They're making life unaffordable, life in the system unaffordable. So if you're trying to live in the system, they're making it, they're making it very hard. Like to live a normal middle-class life, you almost need to be making a hundred thousand or more. It's it's the real estate market, I mean, and David pointed that out to me. It blew my fucking mind that the the real estate speculation and the fact that you can have a safe investment where you buy land and then just you have no incentive to put somebody in it. That's why there's a million empty houses in L.A. and and there's there's way less people than that on the streets that we could we could house everybody. It's because people treat land, treat this earth like a poker chip to make them money, and they they aren't incentivized by this system to put people in it to actually provide a service. There was a generation of very deluded Americans back in the 70s that started slapping a bumper sticker on their car and on their RVs and their vacation homes. And it said very frighteningly, I'm spending my children's inheritance. Well, you guys are the children of the folks that slapped that on the uh, bumper stickers. I'm glad I never sold out to that. I never, I'm glad that I took a tent rather than an RV. I'm glad that I never bought a house. And I'm glad that you guys recognize that those things are dead ends. And, and folks like Iman recognizing that, the, that they're dead ends. And now we can liberate ourselves because those illusions are being washed away. And so sad to see a whole generation that I grew up in forget that. Uh, bring us all back, you guys. So speaking of bringing it back, uh, how, how do you propose that we move forward in distancing ourselves from this archaic for-profit paradigm and growing uh, closer and closer in evolution as a society to, to materializing a community like what you all experienced and were a part of at Echo Park? Well, I would, my own little practical thought is what if instead of one wallet, we had two? What if on one wallet you had, okay, all that greed and all that temptation and everything over there, and then on your on your other pocket or the other side, the purse on your other shoulder, you had a love wallet. And the only thing that you could put in that love wallet were things that you did for all of humanity to save everybody, to see the Lord's will, to see heaven's will happen, to see everybody loved as equally and that everybody share the struggle and suffering and the beauty of the struggle and suffering of life together so that when we end our lives we have a beautiful story of what we gave for everybody rather than just took for ourselves and believing in the you know what the spiritual laws say that if you give people choice you trust and you you let them make that choice sacred we'll find the balance and i i think that's a practical solution buckmeister fuller said you know rather than if you see something obsolete don't try to oppose it just create the alternative that does finally make it obsolete that would be my practical thought what about you Amon? I think I think there are some practical things we could do, but there's also like a larger reality that people must accept. And before I get to that larger reality, the practical things you can do is alternative media like y'all. Because when you read the LA Times article, I haven't read a single LA Times. I think I think I read one one of them. And after I read it and the bullshit they wrote about us, I was like, you see, what is this nonsense? And I never read another one. So they're not in my thought process. I don't know what CNN's saying. I don't know what Fox saying. They're not in my thought process. Like people got to come tell me things that the city's saying about me because I don't know it. They're not in my thought process. So just cut that out and let them be an echo chamber for themselves. If you must hear media, let it be alternative and then discover which ones, you know, are sounding like people speaking truth for the sake of truth, like y'all, right? Uh, alternative media is where you'll hear new and fresh ideas. But if you go to the New York Times or the LA Times or CNN, those are sold and bought. So you'll never hear anything refreshing or new and you'll keep your soul trapped. So a, ignore uh, mainstream societal norms and just live your life focused on your immediate mile. You know, you had so many people throughout the year coming to Echo Park saying, wow, what a great community. What can we do to help? How many miles did you just drive here to say that to me? How many other encampments along the way did you pass? Instead of focusing on something that's already working, uh, just do it yourself. Take action, not just thoughts, not just nice words. Take the daily action, right, day in and day out, and focus on your immediate mile. And when I say focus, I mean focus with, like, love. So if your immediate mile has no one housed, okay, cool. 
Just love your house neighbor. Build something there. Don't like branch out mile by mile, but don't go thinking you're going to solve Israel and Palestine and then focus all day hearing about what's going on in Israel and Palestine. And then you've lost five years and have done nothing for nobody in Israel and Palestine are still doing their thing. Like be realistic to what you can do. Love the mile God put in front of you. And if everybody did that, these miles would grow to the world. So ignore uh, in terms of the practical solutions, I'd say, Ignore uh, mainstream societal norms because all they're doing is flooding you with false narratives. So either listen to nothing or listen to alternative media and, you know, have your own thoughts. And then two, love your immediate mile, wherever you're at, love your immediate mile, and then you'll see the world change. But here's that third part, the part where that harsher, larger reality we must embrace, that the current power structures the ones with all the guns in the military, they won't allow love to really thrive right now. We live in a police state that has showed what they will do when people uh, come together and have their own thoughts. They'll shut that shit down with an occupational force, and they'll do that all the time. So we need to come together as a society and ask ourselves, are we okay with living in a police state? You know, just because we don't see it for six months out of the year, and maybe we'll see it one day, and then maybe another year, a few years, we won't see it. It's there. Are you okay with living in a police state? We have to, we have to unite. You know, that's where my mind is now. Like, yeah, love your mile. Yeah, we intend on building the, uh, the park where we're going to go to. We're going to build more showers. We're going to make it and provide these services for my unhoused neighbors. All that's going to happen, but it's pointless if power structures get to shut it down and then the public moves on and forgets about it because then the power structure changes the media conversation. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. There's like a larger, harsher reality that there's a tipping point this year, the next decade or the next, it's just going to get so horrible that there will be a revolution. Cause even Thomas Jefferson said, you know, for freedom, and I'm going to misquote him, but basically if you want your freedom every so often, you're going to have to shed some blood for it because a few will come, they will be corrupt, they will take it. This has been all of human history. We must look to the past to learn from its mistakes. If we remain apathetic, if we remain content, if we say, oh, that's, you know, we don't want to do this, that's like a future thing, or that was the past, nothing will change. Like, we have to accept the larger reality that it may just be time for revolution because the current people in power, they're not listening. They're corrupt down to the soul. Hashtag revolution now. Yeah, for real. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the imminent pressing, all-encompassing gun in all of our faces, the fire that is coming to our prairie, that is that is going to burn down everything, that is going to take so many people from their houses. I mean, climate change is going to cause a billion climate refugees within like the next 50, 50 years. I mean, and even less. And it, it accelerates every single day that people are being taken from their homes, our, our home. Our home is this earth. That is our home. And we are all going to be homeless if we don't massively come together and and reorient our priorities. Basically, the homeless issue, it shows us how difficult it is for us to empathize with the earth, with uh, the, the biodiversity of all the plants and animals and species out here. We can't even empathize with our own species. That's how compromised our minds are. That's how compromised our empathetic faculties are. We need to come together rapidly, massively, and right now. We can't wait for tomorrow. We do need a revolution. We do need a revolution of love that doesn't perpetuate this, this cycle, this inner cycle, like, like addicts go through, where, or people who go through abuse, like so many of the people in the streets are traumatized. Because somebody abused them, somebody hurt them, and they carry that cycle on, but they seek it unconsciously. And it's like all of us are unconsciously seeking the perfection of this destruction. We are, we are seeking to end this cycle with our own death, with the end of everything, with the death of our home. And we need to break that cycle. We need to break that cycle with love. We need to break that cycle by accepting us all, by saying that this earth is big enough, is abundant enough to take care of all of us, that it is our home. It is a good home. And we don't want to live in space. Fuck that shit. We want this earth to live. We want to live and love. There's just, there's so much to bring in here. There's so much to talk about in this issue. It, it's so enormous. And I think it's not just this massive problem, but within this problem, we can understand so much about our society. We really can. We can really understand our place in this world. I mean, for me, living out truly outside of this system gave me more of myself than, than, and than I ever gained living in this system, eating of all its, of all its poisonous glyphosate infested fruits, you know? So being out on the streets, it's like, it, it's, it's life. It's really reconnecting. It's, it's walking outside of the shell of individualism and walking out into 
humanity into being connected. And so I want to ask you, David, why do people in this position and, you know, the narrative is that, that, that the city has is that we're trying to end homelessness. They have this bullshit narrative, this completely false narrative that they are trying to end homelessness and get people help and get people into shelters and that they're the good guy. And people like you and people like, like the Echo Park Rise Up community and Street Watch are their enemies and are opposing it. And that the homeless don't want to, they don't want to accept services. They don't want to go to our shelters. We're giving them everything and they, they just want to be lazy and drug addicted, blah, 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 blah. As somebody who has... May, chosen to remain homeless yourself, David, what, what is your perspective on that? Why do people refuse the state's, the state's false olive branch? Well, there there's even a whole is discussion one. about the difference between a choice and a dilemma. But uh, I do want to just quickly talk on something Iman said, and I just totally agree, that you have to recognize that uh, we're not going to have change unless people are ready to face sacrifice. And people are afraid of that word, but I'll tell you something. When you look at sacrifice, when you, when you embrace it, you realize it's not a sacrifice. It's a liberation. I had uh, three VCRs. I had an oceanfront apartment uh, with a, in Venice Beach. I had a Triumph sports car. Uh, I had more money than I knew what to do with. I had all the books I ever wanted, a cabinet full of liquor at one point in my life. And it was all for me. When, you, when you're ready to say, I'm going to put that all aside, uh, just like the Buddha did and so many of the other great teachers, the message there is when it comes time to put your body on the line, as Iman says, don't run. That's where you're going to find your strength. You're going to see it there in that moment when you make that decision, I'm not running anymore. Uh, I'm not running from my boss's threats. I'm not running from the police threats. I'm taking a stand. And so I just totally agree with Iman on that. And then as far as the, what happened at Echo Park Lake, it's very clear that uh, the community that Iman and those of us who are unhoused were all contributing to in various levels on that west side was an ideal model community that capitalism can't create. And so what they did was they told park rangers to stop picking up, quote, homeless trash. They told the police to let the rest of the park descend into disorder so they could mask the success of this place that was created outside of the capitalist system. And part of uh, the goal of alternative media like yours is to um, get out the real message, the real truth of that. Help us break through these false narratives uh, so that they can't just prop them up so easily anymore. Uh, I think what we're, one of the things that we're hoping to do is uh, go to the district attorney and demand a criminal investigation uh, and uncover all the sleaze and all the intentional attempts to make Echo Park look bad uh, by the politicians in that area once they realized that the alternative there was just too amazing. I want to say one other thing, too. And that was something that Matt brought up earlier. Matt, you were talking about uniqueness of the Echo Park setting. In terms of the setting, as I'm in said, it's a, you know, this, the important setting is where you set your heart. I think one of the key things about the setting of Echo Park wasn't for us homeless who have decided to focus on our hearts. It was for the house people that came to that community because that park was one of the few places where they could unwind, where they could take their mind off of all the capitalism around them. So the best thing, the, the biggest benefit of having this loving community in that park setting was it freed up the house people's minds enough to where they could actually look and see at the community garden that, they, that we built there, that they could actually see the community kitchen that we built there and, and take it in. Uh, so the biggest benefit of that being in the park was for the house people so that they could take their minds off of everything else around them and see what could actually happen when people just came together. I really I really like that. I think that's a, a good point, too. Um, and that's probably, I think, one of the reasons why, you know, Iman was saying the police, the police state and, uh, you know, those in control uh, who have the authority, uh, you know, probably don't like you know, people seeing that people seeing that essentially you can have a functioning, uh, happy community, 
uh, without money where people are sharing, uh, you know, and loving each other and cooperating and it actually works. And, and to those, we were an uh, amenity you know, were to that promoting- park. We were, we were a flowering in that park and the police state and the politicians directing them, uh, said, go out there and bury it because it terrified them that we could do something without all of their obsessive greed. Right. And, and, and it's kind of a testament, too, to really what's possible. I mean, if a group of people who essentially are, are, you know, very low on resources, right? You know, you have a group of people who have lost their homes, lost their jobs, uh, and, and essentially don't have a lot as far as material resources, uh, you know, physical resources are concerned. If a group of people like that can come together and create something that you did, you know, to the extent, uh, you know, that you did, and it was working as well as it was. I mean, just imagine what what people, you know, a, a larger group of people that are really dedicated that that have, you know, access to more resources. Uh, if, if they develop that sort of mindset, imagine what it could turn into and, and where it could go. And and essentially, I think what you guys have done is very interesting because you've taken, you know, what, essentially what we kind of call the concept of, you know, resource based economy of, you know, some of the things we'll talk a lot about on this show. Uh, as opposed to a monetary based economy, we were taking an economy based on resources and sharing cooperation, uh, things like that. And and you've essentially created that from as, uh, nothing more than a group of people in a park, which is which is really kind of quite astounding, because a lot of us in this community have kind of trying to been searching uh, for, you know, ways uh, to to bring those sorts of systems and those kind of communities about, uh, which is fi- w- one of the reasons why I find it very intriguing that you that you folks were successful as, as you were a- as successful as you were in creating that endeavor. And I think it's it's a testament to how much, uh, like Iman was saying, the mindset and the people themselves coming together they're actually talking to about it, consciously creating situations like that, um, you know, can be effective. If you have people that are of the same mindset that consciously choose to come together, share, love each other, create those sorts of, um, you know, uh, kind of cooperative communities, then things like this are possible. And uh, it, I, I almost see what you guys did as really kind of a base uh, community model, uh, you know, on a small, you know, uh, it kind of a low tech scale, I, I suppose you could kind of call it because resource based economy is, you know, based a lot on automation and implementation of science and technology and things like that. But I mean, it's it's like if you were if you folks were able to do so much with just that one location in that one park, I mean, just imagine just using that basis, like you said, the community, the sharing, the cooperation, coming together, talking about it. I really feel like that is a solid foundation to a lot of the things that we're talking about within the movement of a moneyless society, resource-based economy, um, and, and a lot of things like that. I'm curious how, how you feel like taking that mindset, how how could you expand upon that and try to help people that are still kind of, you know, I want to say trapped in the system, but like you're saying, they just don't really have the time or the energy or the bandwidth to really start creating or focusing things like that. How could what what's your advice to to people who are interested in creating communities and systems like this? I was wondering if you might be able to expand upon that a little bit. How could we use, you know, that mindset as a basis to really start building things, you know, on a community wide scale, you know, not just like maybe a, a few dozen or 100 people like in a park, but say, to, how, how could you start to scale that up? What ideas could we use for systems and structures, you know, community development, cooperative structures and things like that, to where you could start to take those systems and scale them throughout a community on a larger scale? How can we take the ideas and the things that you folks have learned being in that situation, implement them into modern society to start to create more communities, more situations like this that are cooperative, resource-based sort of things? I think when we use all these different words and all these different things, it muddies what actually is. I mean, just do what you do and do it quickly. If you think that a shower needs to be built, start building that shower and watch as you attract like-minded folks around you. Uh, if you want to build a community of love, you need to actually start. You need to, you, you, you just need to do it, right? Go up to your neighbor. You just need to tell them how much you love them, right? Uh, if you have a small amount of resources, you need to spread it. And the thing about community is it's a heart and mind thing. So it's not something to be implemented as it is something to be understood. So the best way to spread it to house folks is by having this conversation, but not just by having this conversation, yes, build it and they will come. Like there needs to be action involved in this. You need to do it. You can't wait 
on society to come help you. You can't wait on the right group of people to come help you. You need to go do it. You, you who understands that all dogs are dogs, right? When you see Poodle versus a big German Shepherd, you still go, oh, they're a dog, right? You don't, you don't look at them differently. You who understands that this material uh, illusion is not what defines the spirit inside. Go out then with your perspective and do something to the world. Like we built a shower in Echo Park because Mayor Garcetti during COVID defunded the showers and there was nowhere to shower. So, you know, I'm not about to go without a hygiene. A lot of people are on the same page. Cool, let's get together and build this shower. We built another shower near an underpass because we were just planning on building showers all over the city if the city didn't want to do it. And what happened was the shower we built at that underpass got torn up the next day by some tweakers. So the perspective in that area was not the perspective we were fighting for there. Like you have to fight for your perspective. There's a lot of bullshit and illusion in this world. And if you have been blessed enough to realize that all there really is, is love and unity, you got to fight for it. You've got to fight for it. When someone comes up saying something else, you got to step up and be like, nope, you're wrong, bro. You're wrong. And then you, you've got, you've got to show them. People have to understand in their hearts and their minds that material doesn't matter and that community does, but it's not something to be, to be implemented. Like you have to, you have to have these conversations. You got to drive the truth. Cause remember the soul knows truth when it hears truth. So you just got to speak it at them and they'll know it. And whether they choose to listen and implement it or they choose to remain selfish, that's their choice. Let's say they choose to remain selfish. All right. Now this person has a different perspective than yours. It's a battle of perspectives. You're, you're not in this, in this world where they get to have theirs and you have yours and yay, everything works out. No, one perspective will destroy the other one. Selfishness will destroy communal love and communal love will destroy selfishness. You got to choose what side you're on, what perspective you get, and you've got to be about it. You can't just talk about it. You've got to be about it. You can't wait years to build a shower. Go build that thing. Oh, what about the city permits? You know how I many people said, should we build this? Well, what, uh, what is a fire department and this, that, and the other going to think? I don't care. I don't care. We're going to build this and then make adjustments when that time comes. If the city wants, if the city wants to build a giant stadium and there's a bunch of people in, in houses that have lived there for 40 years, that's not going to stop them. So that shouldn't stop us. It shouldn't stop. It should not stop us. Like I, I remember talking to, uh, a guy, a YouTuber, I won't say his name, and he's drudged up in the system. You know, when I'm saying that politicians got to change laws, he's like, oh man, it takes 10 to 15 years to get that law passed. What? It'll take 10 to 15 years to get a law we want passed. It'll take half a day for some real estate person to get their law passed. That means law never existed in the first place. So forget man-made law because it's being run like a high school popularity contest. It's not- Amen to that. that. It's not grounded to that. in righteousness. So forget man-made law, focus on the universal laws at hand. And if you understand the words that came out of our mouth, you know what I mean? You understand, you connect with that notion of love. When you see an old lady and you see your grandma and her, regardless of how that old lady looks, do you understand what love really is and spirit is? then go out into the world with it and do something with it. Don't wait for permission. Don't ask. Don't even wait for people. The people will come and the things will be attracted to you when they come, but go out there and do it. Action is so important. Go out there and do it and do it now. We have to unite now. We have to build now, everything now. I think uh, to anybody that's listening right now that, that thinks they can help in any way, reach out. Like let's, let's make some, let's make an impact on these things. I mean, we, a big part of this, podcast about a big part of this movement is people all over the world coming together. I mean, just, just, just as we started this podcast and I've gotten involved in this group, I'm getting messages from people all over the world. They're like, I've got a community in Africa. I've got a community in India. I mean, there's people all over the world that Matt, you said something earlier that they, that they had less, that they didn't have a lot of resources there. I, I disagree with that. They had human resources. That is the greatest resources, human creativity, that we don't need automation to meet everybody's needs and exceed them. When, when everybody cooks, and everybody shares a meal, everybody eats more than they need, you know? You ever notice that? It's like when one person hoards their food, or if they have a limited amount of something, they don't have enough. But when everybody comes together and, and pitches in one ingredient, everybody eats until they're completely stuffed. And that is, that is the metaphor. That is us. That is our potential. That is the power that we have in our human resources. And if we can break off these shackles of the limitations of like, oh, well, this is the system, and this is the way it has to be, and the necessity of the economic bullshit 
religious cult that we're in right now, if we can shake that off and just realize that we can do anything, it'll change will get change will happen and it'll come faster than in 10 years. It'll it'll change when we change it. And not not all of us in an individual con- consensus of, oh, you know, I'm going to change my consumer choices. I'm going to change, change this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to fuck that. We need to come together right now. And th- these individual changes will be escalated way quicker when we're working together, when we have a group of people that are working to break us out of this mental prison, when we have a group of people that are working to plant and grow and grow together and change and a new culture will arise. And all of the things, all the problems that are on the horizon for us, all of the technical things, all of the engineering issues. I don't think, I don't think all this RBE stuff, I don't think it's just an engineering problem. I don't think it's just a design problem. It's a, it's a problem of the restrictions that keep human creativity and innovation from just like, like a river going back to the ocean, because that's what we do. We create, we dream, we build when we can, when we come together, when we get out of this, all of this nonsense, this nightmare, that we're in. You can start by just creating a little mutual aid community in your neighborhood, um, as Echo Park Street Watch did. Find a, find some need. It might be with uh, immigrants. It might be with the undocumented. It might be with the homeless. It might be with single mothers. You know, it might be with children who have are in the streets and 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 are because their parents are so busy working. Create a mutual aid program to bring out whatever their resources are that they need. Do they need place? Do they need recreation equipment? Do they need uh, sanctuary uh, to be hiding from, you know, police oppression? Do they need um, battery? Do they need a place to charge up their cell phones if they're homeless? Uh, that's one of the things that has been one of the big, besides the showers, uh, the cell phone charging for the people on the street in Echo Park's neighborhood is one of the one of the best outreaches, in my opinion, that we've seen. Mutual aid, that's the way forward. And I think what happens is when people involve themselves in these mutual aid groups, they develop the, the connections and the expertise so that as the situation does deteriorate, we're already up to speed and skilled and ready to take on these challenges that the government is falling apart and not meeting and meet them ourselves and create the new form of democracy that will do what this one is failing to do. That's a really great point. I think a lot of people kind of uh, wonder exactly what mechanisms would operate as far as, uh, you know, like just kind of sharing cooperation, resource distribution and things like that. And I think you touched the nail on the head there too, uh, you know, with the term mutual aid. Um, that's not that's not something you hear uh, very often, you know, in modern society. But I think in a, in a resource-based economy, you know, the mutual aid function will be... Um, you know, critical, uh, I think, to a lot of uh, to a lot of the functioning within that type of a society, you know, or economic system. It, it's a term mm-hmm. that puts the focus where it should be. And that is that it's not helping somebody else. It's a mutually reciprocal process where you become aware of your connection to the community and in a deeper way by reaching out to uh, the people around you. You'll find out what your needs really are <laughs> when you do that. It's mutual. It's definitely mutual. So uh, quick question. I, I kind of I want to bring things around here. Um, uh, I'd like the two of you to basically give, give anybody listening uh, some, some places where they can get involved, ways to contact you, ways to take a stand, ways to reach out, et cetera. Um, the potential in LA for organizing and, and basically taking this crisis and turning it into a tremendous opportunity is unfounded. And, and it's, it, it, it's a, there's an enormous opportunity there. There's enormous need, and there's an enormous chance for change, and to 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 just break the mold, to break the narrative completely. And that's what people like Iman and David, and so many people that are out there on the streets, so many creative, brilliant individuals who are doing so much with their heart and their soul, which is really all you need to create change, which is really all that we truly need to to exist here. So I I, I kind of want to turn it to Iman or David, if either of you has a message, a closing statement. To the people of Earth, to the people that are listening right now, what what can we do? You know, what what should we understand? What would you? What is vital for people to understand as we as we close out this be- beautiful episode here? In terms of contact and helping us, I mean, you don't really have to. We're good right now with the mutual aid groups we got. And you know, if you don't live directly in LA, like I said, focus on your immediate mile. Uh, you know, if you want to keep in touch with what's going on out here and reach up, that's fine. But don't put your heart and mind out here when your neighbors are all around you. You know, love your neighbors as you love yourself. Your neighbors, you've got neighbors within a mile. They're way closer to you than I am. 
Um, in terms of like what people can do to start, they just have to start. Like I said, if you understand the fundamentals that we talked about in this show, that you are not the material, you're the spirit, that love is all that matters and the material gains you gain won't make you happy. Like if you get that, then start, start. And you know, you might be asking, what does that look like? Uh, let's say you live in a nice neighborhood with no quote unquote issue, right? There's no undocumented this, there's no unhoused this, and it's just a quote unquote, I gotta keep doing these but these labels divide us, I don't exist, but it's just a normal neighborhood. Start by eating and organizing a meal together. See if you can't get your block to eat together. It's, that's gonna be hard in and of itself, trust me. People can come up with a lot of bullshit excuses of why they can't just sit down and eat. Figure out a way to have these conversations with your neighbors and see if you can get your street to sit down, cook, and eat a meal together. And then from there, see if you can't get people around you to start doing more things together. But we've got to do things together. And one last thing, you can't uh, fight a revolution and work a nine to five job in the revolution you're fighting. Like at some point you need to make your decisions about what your, pri what, what your priorities are. You know, your priority can't be oh, I want to see love and change, but I also want to make sure that my house and my family and everything's okay. Like, no, understand everything will be okay. That uh, Hollywood put a false narrative that when you become homeless, everything falls apart. It's the greatest liberation. You're still alive. You're still eating. You're still sleeping. You're still alive. I've been homeless four years. So clearly I'm still alive. Um, you need to make a choice. You can't both be in the revolution and working for the system. You've got to make a choice. And then just do what you do and do it quickly. David, what's your what's your message for the world? I I I'm not, I think Iman just summed it up. <laughs> I'll go with that. The that message is more the love, right? The sooner you get yourself out of the system, the sooner you get yourself out of the system, uh, the better. And if you need Agreed. something tangible, if you need like if you're if you're just so minute and thinking that you just need to be told what to do, then start by organizing a meal with your immediate neighbors, as many as you can. Let that be your actual homework, whoever's listening. Get a meal going with your neighborhood, your apartment complex. Get a legitimate meal going. It's going to take a few weeks. We'll see. Your action homework. I love that term. Let's normalize that. For anyone who wants to participate in this movement going forward, do some action homework and start small. And just keep in mind that you, you your intention is to scale it up but within your limits. So yeah, just more love, like David says, and action homework, like Iman says, put that together and just get out there and do it now. Don't let years go by. Don't let generations go by like our legislative uh, leaders do. And don't take it for granted that the you know problem or opportunity of homelessness can't happen to you because this system is closing the vice grip down on all of us. If you look out at somebody on the street and you say, oh, that could never happen to me. I would never make choices like that. It's, 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 it's irrelevant because, the, because regardless of you, this system, we are all in, interconnected. We're all interconnected. And I don't mean in a hippie woo-woo way. I mean that the actions of some dictate the realities of all of us. And that right now, that means the people who have power, their actions affect all of us. So whether you like it or not, whether you're in that system or not, whether you're a part of it, whether you're the benefactor of it, whether you're the richest man in the world, your actions, your participation in this system is going to rob your child of a home. It's going to rob your loved ones of a place to rest their head. It's going to rob all of us of community. And if we don't come together and start having these talks and breaking bread together, we're not going to have a home to come home to. It's beautiful. Well, thank you guys for coming on. I guess that'll be a wrap for our second episode of Moneyless Society. Thoroughly enjoyed talking to you guys and, and hearing your story, hearing everything you're doing. Wish you guys the best of luck, and I hope you hope you can come on again uh, in the not too distant future and uh, keep us updated with um, anything anything transpiring out there. For sure. Thank you guys. Thank you for coming yeah. onto the show. Thank you for all that you do. You know. Thank you for, I, I know that as soon as this call ends, as soon as this show is over, as soon as that mic stops, you are not going to stop doing what you're doing. You are not going to stop dropping this truth. You're not going to stop living for and aligning yourself with love in its truest and most powerful and profound form. I mean, you said on a, on a, at a speech recently that these people, when they do this to us, they're creating soldiers. That the, the more evil and intense this system gets, the, the more, the louder the helicopters get, the more cops are busting down our doors. They are creating soldiers. They are creating their opposition. This system's complete and utter failure is its own undoing. So I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. 
I'm optimistic about this. And as more people experience homelessness like this with communities like y'all are creating and participating in and just the love that you give, you're creating more citizens of a new world, of a new and better world. And I invite anybody listening to join us, that you're not separate, that just because you have uh, money in your wallet, that doesn't mean you're any different than anyone here. Postscript. I really wanted to end this episode on an uplifting note, but this is not always a hopeful subject. Right on the eve of this episode's release, as we recorded it several weeks ago, our friends David and Iman were arrested in total violation of the empty promises the city made to get them off the lake. They were apprehended and jailed for creating another community in Grant Park, arrested for cooking food together, for bedding down in their own city under the stars for living. Their crime was and is existence in clear and shining deference to the cruel and pointless whimsy of the monetary system. They will continue to shine bright as living alternatives and the system will continue to hunt them and all the unhoused, the poor, the marginalized, and anyone that doesn't fit into its narrow game of extraction, especially if they have a smile on their face. We as a society are not making strides to end this horror those of us on the streets have not just been abandoned by society, but it actively wages war against them. We are all we have, so please look out for your neighbors. Give a shit. Don't be silent. None of us can rest easy so long as any one of us has no place to rest their head. We need each other in this twisted moment. In the spirit of these two beautiful comrades, we need to demand sweeping structural change to make damn sure nobody's existence is criminalized that everyone has what they need to live. And community is not an act of protest. And until that day and thereafter, we need to love each other like the fate of the whole world depends on it. Because it does. <laughs>